everybody this is jerry and welcome to my channel jerry in stitches where i share with you my sewing journey and adventures <laughs> and this past week i've been really busy with this dress that i created i sewed this up and i also tie dyed it and this is the second time i'm working with the golden rule system of drafting patterns and it has been fun this is pattern number 151 and it, it is a tent dress with flutter sleeves. So I really love the movement of this whole dress. yippee yay! yay So in this video, you'll see me drafting the dress, sewing it up, and then tie-dyeing the dress. It's actually a very simple uh, dress in terms of sewing construction. And I will focus the sewing tutorial on how I constructed the back. Can you see it? the back keyhole opening with a button loop closure. So uh, that's what we're up for today. I'm really excited to share with you all this content. Uh, let's jump right in! In order to draft the dress, I would need all the tools from the Golden Rule kit. Here's the pattern book with the pattern and instructions, and I will be drafting pattern 151. Um, and in the back of the page are the pattern pieces for the back and the front of the dress. Here's the belt strap pattern and the collar pattern, but I won't be drafting those. There's also an option to close up the neckline edge with facings, but I'll be doing that with bias binding instead, and I'll show you how later. Here's the special tape measure that makes all the drafting magic happen. With the regular end of the measuring tape, I will take my bust and hit measurements. And with the other end, I'm going to use it to plot out the important dots that will make up the pattern pieces. These push pins provided will help me plot out the dots when used with the tape measure and a marker to mark the dots and sticky tape to secure the paper. And after plotting the dots, I will connect them with these French curves and rulers provided. Let's start drafting. In preparation for drafting the front of the dress, I have tracing paper set on top of some cardboard so that there's something that the push pin can grip onto. I locate my bust measurement, which is 84, on the drafting strip of the tape measure, and there is a corresponding hole that my push pin can be inserted through. Next, I locate the X that accompanies every pattern piece and pierce the push pin through the center of the X. In order to plot out the necessary dots, I align the tape measure with the lines radiating from the pattern, and each line will have an accompanying number which tells me where to mark each dot. To prevent shifting of the pattern paper, I secure it well with sticky tape onto the drafting paper. Then I can start plotting the dots. For all the dots from the waistline up, I am using the bust measurement. And for all the dots below the waist, I will shift the push pin to my hip measurement. Make sure to plot the dots on the side of the tape measure where the push pin is closest to. When I was plotting this specific pattern, I realized that the dress tents out quite a bit below the waist. So instead of shifting the push pin point to my hip measurement, I just kept it at my bust measurement. You can of course do it differently if you want a more voluminous dress. That's part of the beauty of the system. You can make adjustments as you go along. Next, I use the rulers provided to help me connect these dots that I've plotted onto my drafting paper. And these rulers are super helpful when drawing curves. And I also keep the symbols page from the pattern book close at hand at this point in time as it helps me decipher all markings so I don't miss any important information as I am drafting the pattern. This is the completed drafting of the front of the dress and I've also added in seam allowances. Don't forget to do that. Um, when sewing, I will connect the shoulder and the side seams with 1.5 centimeter seam allowance and I plan to finish the sleeve hem with a bias binding so I've allowed uh, or I've added a 1cm seam allowance and I'll be doing the same for the neckline of the dress. The center front is a fold line and the hem is going to be a baby hem with a 1.4cm seam allowance. First, I want to show the end result of the back keyhole opening so that you understand where I'm headed with the sewing tutorial. 
This is probably the most complicated bit of sewing in an otherwise straightforward pattern. That said, I have an easy solution for the back keyhole when paired up with a bias binding finish of the neckline and a button loop closure. As you can see, the button loop is encased in the bias binding of the neckline. The other steps of the sewing include sewing up the shoulder seam and the side seam, finishing off the sleeve hem, I did it with bias binding, and lastly, finishing off the dress hem. Here is the hem of the dress um, flipped over so that you can see that I closed it with a baby hem and also you can see that the center back seam was pressed open with the raw edges folded under and surged. Basically, the back keyhole opening is an unconnected portion of the back center seam. I stopped sewing the back center seam 15 centimeters from the neckline then top stitched the seam allowances around the opening. I'm now going to apply bias binding to the neckline and before the dress is dyed, you can see more clearly how the back center seam is closed up leaving a 15 centimeter gap from the neckline and you can also clearly see the top stitching around the opening. I am going to show you again how I surged and folded the raw edges under for the back center seam. Before installing bias binding, make sure that the shoulder seams are sewn and I cut out bias tape that is 3 centimeters wide for closing the neckline. I'm going to do this off camera and come back just before I sew on the last row of stitching connecting bias binding to the neckline. As you can see here, one edge of the bias binding has been attached to the neckline and the bias is understitched to the seam allowance. The back keyhole opening is going to be closed with a button loop closure and on one side where the button is, leave enough excess bias tape so that it can be folded under for a neat finish. The same thing is going to happen on the other end of the bias tape but we are also going to encase a button loop in the binding before we close it off. Here's a 10 centimeter length of bias binding which is 3 centimeters wide and I folded it in half sewing about 3 millimeters from the folded edge. With the help of a loop turner, I'm going to turn this right side out and voila we've made a button loop. I trimmed this to 5 centimeters long then folded in half and carefully encase this inside the bias binding on one end of the back neckline. There we go. Now this can be basted securely, but I'm going to do a shortcut and just pin it down with some pins. And then it's going to be brought to the sewing machine and the last stitching row that needs to happen to connect the bias binding to the neckline is going to be sewn together with the button loop. And when stitching, remember to fold the other end of the bias binding as well where the button is going to be. I am stitching the right side of the dress facing upward. Because of the translucent fabric, I can see that I am catching the edge of the bias binding as I am sewing. My advice here is to go slow since this is a very visible top stitching line. And if you want a nice finish, you can also take the time to hand base the binding to the neckline before bringing it to the machine. That will help prevent puckering that may happen, especially going around sharp corners. There, I'm finishing off the button loop. Make sure that you backstitch a couple of times to keep the button loop secure in the bias binding. After tackling the most challenging step in the construction, the rest of the sewing is a breeze. So here's the finished dress in all its glory before dyeing. Next up, I'm folding and binding the dress before it goes into the dye vat. Before dyeing the dress, it has to be folded and bound. The main binding tool that I'm using is sinew, which is wax strong string. The link will be in the description box. I will also be using a washable marker to help me mark out my two main dyeing circles. A concentration of circular patterns will happen here on the bottom right side and there on the top left hand corner of the dress. So in order to mark the dress, this is how I do it. Connect the washable marker with a piece of string and then with the string tightly secured at the center point, mark your circle. I do the same thing with the top left of the dress, now using the underarm uh, seam as the center of the circle. With the help of a ruler, I fold the bottom circle into 16 equal parts. The slippery nature of the viscose is making me really nervous and I hope the fold lines will be sharp. I'm aiming for a snowflake pattern, so after folding in half, fold again into a quarter, 
then fold that quarter into a triangle and then fold it one more time for a smaller triangle. Then flip this whole uh, shape so that we can fold the remaining quarter in the same way. So one fold and then another fold. And now this uh, fabric is ready to be marked for the lines of the snowflake. These lines can be drawn in however you wish. I find that zigzags and teardrop patterns make for especially beautiful mandala designs. And I stop making these markings when I reach the edge of the initial circle that I drew. To bind up the fabric with the markings as guidelines, first make a slip knot with a sinew or wax string. Then secure the loop created around the first marking on the fabric closest to the center point. Pull on the string to tighten the loop around the marking line, then wrap the string a few more times around to bind securely. The tighter the bind, the more resist created during the dyeing process. Tie a knot at the end and pull the string tightly so that it doesn't unravel. Before binding at the next marking, I slip the loop of the slip knot through before I make pleats or folds in the fabric along the line markings. Again, I pull tightly to keep the folds from unraveling and I wrap the string around the marking line a few more times to keep a tight bind. So I'm going to repeat this pleating or folding process and then binding these folds in the same way. And here's a closer view of how I'm working on the next marking line. And it's a little bit challenging because of the fabric. It's really slippery. Um, it's a viscose and it's quite difficult to fold and keep in place. And as you can see, I am not tying any more slip knots. I'm just going ahead and connecting one wrap of the folds with another. And this can be done because of the special quality of this wax string. It actually uh, stays in place whenever you wrap it up tightly. And you see me working on the teardrop line and I create more folds here because the line is longer than the uh, zigzag lines that I made on the fabric. Um, at the end of this, you might want to tie up a knot and then pull tightly. Now I'm folding the top left circle of the dress that I drew from before. And as you can see, I am stabilizing with one hand at the center of the circle. And with the other hand, my fingers are moving along the edge of the circle and pleating the fabric as I go along. So this will help create a dye resist, uh, demarcating a circle on the fabric. And when I've finished with this, I'm going to bind that quickly with a rubber band. And then for the rest of the fan folds, I am also going to create more um, circular patterns with the wax string or the sinew and these will create concentric circles in this pattern. At this point, for the rest of the fabric that is still unbound, I am going to do a simple crumple die technique or binding technique. And with some rubber bands and also with the help of the sinew, I am just going to crumple up the fabric and then just bind that up. Um, it's kind of arbitrary, uh, the pattern that will result from this. And at the end, the bound up fabric will look like this. This part is the bottom right half and that is the top left and that's the crumpled die. So here we go, let's die! For the stovetop method, in goes a teaspoon of dishwashing liquid with half a cup of salt and stir it all up with about six liters of water. And then this would be about 113 milliliters of dye, whatever color you want. Again, stir it all up and keep the water simmering when you are putting in your fabric. In it goes. And I keep the fabric inside for at least 10 minutes before I take it out, color fix it, put it through a cold rinse and then launder. So make sure to go through all these steps. And the most exciting part is always taking out the bindings. The simple lines of this golden rule dress really work well in showcasing interesting and unusual fabrics. So it's a perfect pattern for a tie-dye project. I am so happy with my dress that I am going to end off with a dance on my balcony, even though it's 
deadly cold and windy outside. It was lots of fun sewing and dyeing this dress and I loved sharing it with you. Remember to subscribe to my channel, give a thumbs up and make a comment. Thanks so much and see you real soon! In the meantime, happy sewing and happy holidays!